Good afternoon. It's a privilege for me to uh, introduce to you a new brand, a new company that just came out of uh, um, the earth called Vet Biotech. And the kickoff of that company, the official kickoff is today. So you are participating to this session uh, as the launch of Vet Biotech. Vet Biotech is uh, a company that will help veterinarians you know, with innovation in multiple disciplines, but essentially in dermatology and nutraceuticals and, and dentistry. So there's a lot of things that will come out of Vet Biotech over the next few months. Uh, today and to start, we are presenting new innovations in the management of uh, bacterial infection, you know, both in the ears and on the skin. So not only resistant, you know, but also just general infection present, you know, in the in the skin in the, in the ear. And we have the pleasure to have with us two um, specialists that have uh, uh, an enormous experience using the molecule that we are using as one of the base molecule for the uh, range of products of Vet Biotech, and that's micronized silver. I'm gonna let them explain to you more about it, and particularly Dr. Mandel. But I would like to thank a few people before we start. First of all, I would like to thank you for coming. And then, of course, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Dunbar Graham, who drove uh, from uh, University of Florida, Gainesville, to be with us today. And you will be uh, acting as a chairman and asking questions and helping, you know, generating a, an interaction and questions and answers, you know, towards the end of this presentation. The second person I would like to thank, uh, and he actually came for way further than you, uh, uh, Dr. Graham, and that's uh, Dr. Mandel, who came from uh, uh, Seattle, uh, the state of Washington, uh, for this lecture. Dr. Mandel and Dr. Graham are both, both certified dermatologists, well recognized. Uh, they actually knew each other when they were doing their residency, if I'm not mistaken, at uh, UC Davis. So it's a sort of a uh, meeting for them again, uh, and it's uh, just uh, nice to see that. Uh, Dr. Mandel has uh, worked with uh, Micronized Silver for several uh, months now and has a very interesting experience uh, with uh, some of the cases that he's going to present to us. He has selected uh, just a few because there are many more, and I'm going to let him uh, talk to you and uh, presenting his lecture. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Moreau. The title of the slide is Bacteria Can't Resist It. And this is introducing the VET biotech versions of the micronized silver. So today I'm going to introduce you to the world of micronized silver. So what is this? Well, this is an innovative, high-tech modification of a substance that's been around since the beginning of time. That's silver. Part of the problem that we've been facing is the organisms are becoming increasingly uh, more adapted uh, to defending themselves, and they're forming what's called a biofilm. And what happens is the organism will, first you'll get contamination of a surface, and then you'll get adhesion of the bacteria to the surface, and then colonization and sort of a super colonization in the the cells start to stick to one another, and they start to generate a, um, an extra cellular polymeric substance uh, that's very high in, um, in um, uh, sugar contents uh, the, uh, um, in all the uh, polysaccharides. You get also serum, fibrin, red cells, uh, DNA, uh, all kinds of proteins in the substance and it forms a slime. The slime coats the organism, prevents the body from getting at it, prevents topical agents from getting to it, and it also starts to change the way the organism behaves. If you think of the, um, a bacterium being like a single computer, not hooked up to anything, and then when it starts to work within a biofilm, it becomes like the internet. They start to come together, and they start to behave differently. It can adapt faster. It can, it can become resistant to antibiotics faster. It can spread faster. So we needed something to break up this biofilm and to go after the organism. But the problem is we're getting increasingly resistant um, 
organisms uh, as far as antibiotic resistance is increasing. So they tell me that every good talk should start with a little humor, but I'm not a stand-up comic, so I thought a cartoon would work. So if you can't read this, it says, Psst, hey kid, want to be a superbug? Stick some of this in your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. Underneath it says, it was a shortcut through the hospital kitchens that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. Now, although this is somewhat humorous, the actual underlying problem is not funny at all. Last year, the CDC in Atlanta reported that there were over 2 million cases of antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections in humans in the United States. And of that 2 million people, 23,000 died from those infections. We have certainly seen increased number of antibiotic-resistant cases of bacterial infections in animals. Uh, we've always had a little problem, but we've never had the problem that we're now experiencing in the last eight to 10 years. So this is a very typical culture pattern that I'm seeing now. Note the date. That was very recent. This is the first time patient. And then here's another one. Note the date. This is all this year. I'm seeing this on a daily basis. It's very, very frustrating sometimes to go to work because most of these cases are being worked up very well by the local veterinarian, but we're just having these super resistant cases. Uh, these two dogs were not owned by the same owner. They're not referred by the same veterinarian, and they were first time cases, so you can't blame the infection on me. So let's discuss what microsilver is. And so also, why, why did we talk about silver? What does it do? How is it made? Where has it been used? Why is it effective? Some in vitro testing, safety and efficacy, development of the product, the ear care system, and some case studies, and some other applications in the skin. So what it is is a 99.97% pure medical grade silver. This silver actually costs more than straight silver bullion to purchase. And it's processed in such a way that it makes it highly porous. And it's microsized. And this microsized particle, with the average particle size being about 10 microns, means that it's not going to penetrate through the skin. If you remember, a red blood cell is about 7 microns in diameter. So this is not going to penetrate through the skin like a nano silver would be, like your colloidal silvers. So you don't have to worry about penetrating deep into the tissue, or for that matter, the silver uh, being lost, because it's the silver ion that generates the, the killing ability uh, of the organism. Now, these scanning electron micrographs show a very nice, here's a, about a, a 10 micron particle, and a close-up view of what that particle looks like. And you can see the amazing number of little interdigitations here all of which massively increases surface area of that particle and makes it a very potent silver ion generator. So historically, silver has been used as a natural antimicrobial agent. My father was a chemist, and when I was a child growing up, I, I remember my, the stories of my father telling me about silver miners often having better complexions than people in the average public would just because of the silver and the effect of the silver on the bacteria on their skin. And Cyrus, uh, one of the founders of the Persian Empire back in the 5th century BC, you can read about him in the book of Ezra in the Bible, um, he drank from silver lined water casks. And the early pioneers had put silver coins in their drinking water and in their milk to keep it fresh and also probably to keep people from stealing it. Uh, French soldiers during World War I drank from silver-lined canteens, and they had less dysentery than GIs who got their water from the same source but did not have silver-lined canteens. It's been used as silver nitrate drops in newborns to prevent uh, bacterial conjunctivitis, and of course, we've all used silver sulfadiazine as burn creams and, and lotions and even in some of the ear products as well. So how does it work? Well, it works by generating silver ions, and micronized silver will continue to generate these ions as long as the particle is there. The particle size being not absorbed by the skin, it will stay there. The silver ions kill bacteria in at least three ways. It inhibits the transmembrane transport proteins. It in 
activates uh, certain intracellular enzymes and damages bacterial DNA. We see a wide variety of bacteria that can be killed by the silver, both gram-positive, gram-negative, uh, also fungi, and even anaerobes. So how is it made? Well, they make it by taking this medical-grade silver wire, and they pass it through a plasma field at 2,000 degrees centigrade. This pretty much turns it into volcanic silver, and it massively increases the porosity over 100 times greater porosity than just straight silver, and that generates more silver ion. This is all very important because it also allows you to get by with less overall silver into the product. Again, the average particle size being 10 microns, not absorbed uh, through the skin. The way I like to look at this is that it kind of does what this does, and that is it's like popping popcorn. You have the popcorn kernels, you know, they're smooth and round and hard, and when you pop it, it expands it, it massively increases the surface area, plus it makes it taste better and doesn't crack your teeth. As far as where has it been used, uh, there's a variety of veterinary skincare products that's been used in human toothpaste, wound care, implants, um, stymen pins have been coated with uh, microsilver. It's been used in bone cement. Uh, that's what they're doing down here. They're putting in a total hip. It's been used in some of the bone cements to cut down on infections at the site of the implant. It's been on the market in various products since 2005 and sold in over 35 countries. I like this slide because it shows quite nicely how the silver is being deposited, the microsilver is being deposited on the surface of the skin and the folds between the skin and creases in the skin cells. These are living skin cells. Uh, you can see individual keratinocytes with the uh, silver surrounding it and the particles clinging to it. So in vitro tests show uh, a variety of, um, of uh, organisms that have been highly uh, affected by the microsilver. Uh, the one important one to me, of course, is the Staphylococcus pseudomedius and the methicillin-resistant ones, but also if I'm dealing with ears or moist areas, pseudomonas. Of course, malesthesia is very common, especially in ears and other places where there's a lot of sebum on the dog or on the cat. Uh, we also have a variety of other really nasty microbes, some of which have had some antibiotic resistance issues going on for many years. So I found that it can work in some of the most severe cases of otitis externa, but also it can work on some of the mild to moderate cases. You can use it in conjunction with antibiotics or without antibiotics. In very difficult cases with a lot of severe inflammation and biofilm formation, I found that adding a steroid can greatly help the product, and uh, I've used dexamethasone as my main steroid that I've added. In both in vitro and vivo tests, these products, such as in toothpaste and wound care, have demonstrated safety and efficacy for well over 10 years. So out of my frustration with some of my cases in the ear, uh, where I had highly antibiotic-resistant bacteria, I approached uh, BioGate with their, um, with their microsilver about conducting a phase one study. During this study, I took several severe otitis cases. I think the least amount of time that any dog had in phase one that had an otitis was about seven years. I had some that were up to 10 to 12 years with, with their ear infection. No antibiotics were used, and initially no topical steroid was used. So here is DART, and um, this is in the phase one study. He actually, I'll present information because he gets carried over into the phase two study as well. So he's seven years old, and um, in this photo, you can note this is um, uh, back when I originally saw him in um, July of uh, 13. Now, I've been following this dog for quite a few years, since 2008, with uh, very limited success, even though I did work him up for his atopy, and we had him on allergens, and they were fairly well controlled. I had him on pre ha for his food allergy, but if he would get into any stray proteins at all, his ears would massively swell, and he'd have horrendous otitis. Then after about 10 weeks on 
this phase one therapy, we had tremendous improvement. I want to point out that a lot of this that you see here is the microsilver mixed with a little cerumen. Once that's flushed out, you can see how much better the ear canal looks. This is after 10 weeks, no antibiotics, uh, nothing but the uh, silver. Plus, these ears were not being flushed. He was just merely putting the microsilver in the solution into the ear. If you look at the little testimonial here that the owner uh, uh, actually submitted uh, to the company, they said right here, given the range of treatments um, that uh, we have tried, we believe that the microsilver to be nothing uh, more than a miracle drug. So I wasn't pleased that I couldn't remove some of the biofilm with uh, that other product. I, I could only uh, work over the organism, but all the cerumen and some of the biofilm, I just wasn't stripping out. I needed something that the owner could use at home. And so we came up with a three-step process. Uh, the first, the flush had surfactants in it uh, to break up the biofilm, to break up the cerumen. Uh, the second was to rinse out some of, the, uh, of that debris and the flush, and also to take away any irrita potential irritational effects of the surfactants. It also contained twice as much silver as the flush, and then the therapy drop was to instill a lot of silver in on top of those organisms, now that we had it all nice and clean, to have maximal impact. And it contains twice as much silver as the rinse, or four times the amount that the flush has. All of this, all these products were tested by Biogate in Germany to make sure that they generated maximal amounts of silver ion, that there'd be nothing in there to inhibit the silver ion generation. I also evaluated, in some cases, the addition of steroids. Many dogs that were in phase one were carried over into the phase two category. I have treated well over 30 cases at this point from the very mild to the very severe, and I'll present mostly the severe cases today. 27 other sites were designated to treat primarily just severe cases. In the phase two evaluation, as I stated, some of the severe cases uh, dexamethasone was added to either the flush or to the therapy formulation. So let's go ahead and look at some of the cases. We'll start again with DART. Now this is phase two. So again, uh, seven-year-old Weimariner always had otitis externa since the time they adopted him from Weimariner Rescue when he was one. I had been treating him for about six years with limited success even though I had worked up his atopy and his food allergy. The owner had kind of stopped using the phase one product, so the ears uh, kind of massively relapsed. So here we are with significant biofilm. You can just see this mucoid material just clinging to this outer opening of this ear canal, starting down into the ear canal a little bit. The right ear was more severely affected than the left, so we're going to show pictures only of the right ear. So note the date, 3, 6 of 14. 18 days later, pre-flush, just like the other ones, were pre-flush. This is not after the ear was flushed. We had remarkable improvement. No steroids were added, no systemic medications. Just the flush, the rinse, and the therapy drops. They were being placed in there daily. Then about nine weeks down the road, uh, at this point, the flush and rinse and therapy had been decreased to twice weekly. Uh, if you notice on the pre-flush, we see a fair amount of debris. This is actually mostly the uh, therapy drops mixed with a little cerumen. Very similar appearance you'll see if you use a lot of the Odopacs where you have some sort of thick gel or, or uh, maybe a lanolin type based product added, it'll, it'll just cling to the wall of the uh, ear canal. So then once that was flushed, you can see dramatic uh, improvement, uh, minimal inflammation. And again, no steroid added to any of this. We did see a little flare once again as uh, spring pollination happened, or maybe got into a little food, but, but again, it calmed down quickly. So now I'm dealing with a 14-year-old golden retriever that has had chronic otitis 
about all her life. The owner doesn't really remember when the dog didn't have some type of ear infection, but it had become a lot worse in the last five years. This dog does indeed have a food allergy, very allergic to wheat, and possibly atopic, but the owner didn't really allow me to do an intradermal skin test or any type of uh, blood allergy test. There was um, quite significant purulent uh, material coming from the right ear. The local vet had been treating with multiple topicals and various flushes and also used uh, systemic steroids and the condition persisted. The ear was cultured and proteus was cultured from the ear. This is sort of pre-flush. You can see a fair amount of inflammation. You can see a lot of hyperplasia where the linings become thickened, a little cobblestone appearance there. And then when you flush it, you can see how inflamed it looks, sort of the shaggy appearance. But you get some of that anyways when you just uh, flush an ear with saline. The epithelial cells will start to lift off, but that's excessive there. Now, this is later where we're having uh, significant uh, material build up in the ear, and it looks like, wow, you didn't, you didn't get anywhere with this. This is actually over a year later. It's not nine weeks, it's over a year later and we're on phase two, because at this point, the owner had been only using the product once a week. And even at that, he was kind of sporadic. But what I want to point out is most of this is therapy drops mixed with a little cerumen. When you actually do cytologies on this, it's negative. And so you've got to be very careful. You've got to educate your, your clients when you're using products that may be somewhat thick that if they see a lot of debris coming from the ear, it doesn't mean that the infection is persisting or the infection is getting worse. It may be the therapy itself. Once we flush it, uh, there is a tremendous decrease in inflammation over what we normally have. And so this is a diff quick stain of just the therapy drops. And this is about uh, 600 uh, magnification, so about 600 times magnification of the human eye. And you can see that uh, some of the microsilver has clumped together, but a lot of those little individual uh, particles there. So now I'm going to deal with a cat. And this cat is a Bengal cat that the owner adopted from a shelter and it had otitis externa uh, right at the time of adoption. It also had chronic urinary tract issues, so it was on a special diet for its urinary tract problems. It also had developed significant liver enzyme elevations of any zole-containing antifungals. So you could not use uh, even a topical uh, in the air without seeing elevation. I tried terbinafine. It did not seem to work. And so we had some issues with the yeast. And also, uh, it had chronic pseudomonas. We cultured pseudomonas from the ear. And the local vet had, at one point, done a dental and looked down deep into the ear and felt that the eardrums were ruptured at that time. This cat was a little difficult to evaluate. He did not like being handled. Um, when he first came to see me, he was on Xenoquin, the marbofloxacin, uh, although the owner felt it was not helping, and thus it was discontinued. Cytology has revealed significant rod-shaped organisms, and since he had just had a culture about two weeks prior to uh, coming to see me, and it grew the pseudomonas, I did not reculture it. Now, in the uh, pretreatment assessment, um, just placing the otoscope, the video otoscope, down into the ear canal. This is a totally awake cat that was not happy about having this, this uh, placed into his ear canal. So you have to kind of take your pictures quickly. I was not going to be able to do flushing through the video otoscope like I normally would if I had uh, like a sedated dog or an anesthetized animal. So the left ear was significantly uh, more affected than the right. So here is a pretreatment uh, glimpse of the infection um, and, the, and all the purulent material in that left ear. And then just two weeks after starting the flush, rinse, and therapy drops, we were using the flush and rinse twice a week and the therapy drops three times a week. This cat hated being handled. Um, and so you can see that we had dramatic improvement, a dramatic decrease in the amount of material being generated. 13 weeks later, you can actually see a tympanic membrane down there. Um, you see some of the uh, therapy drops. At this point, the owner had only been doing everything once a week, but we stopped the therapy drops and went to twice weekly flush and rinse. 
and he continues to do very well. He does indeed uh, have uh, still scant numbers of pseudomonas that we have found on a culture, but he is clinically doing very, very well. With that, I'd like to go back. So this is an intertriginous dermatitis. So that means between the folds. This is an intermammary fold on an old dog owned by an elderly lady who had a very difficult time treating this dog. Um, she uh, had a lot of health problems and she could not treat the dog. So she had a friend uh, treat the dog. So it was only getting a microsilver spray applied twice a week. And she had so much health problems it took her about six months to report back to me. Uh, she was in the hospital for a good part of that time. It did not take six months for this to clear. But within about three weeks, uh, it, she said it already started looking very, very good. And so there's some before and after photos of this dog. At this point, um, Microsilver has been used by over 100 companies with over 200 products. It's been available in skincare products ranging from bandages to sprays to gels to bone cement, to, uh, medical polymers, uh, Steinman pins have been coated with it, pediatric creams and toothpaste. It's a patented technology and it's based on scientific uh, information. There's multiple publications and peer-reviewed articles. The microsilver technology is being applied by Vet Biotech to the next generation of veterinary dermatology products. So when are we going to use microsilver? Are we going to only use microsilver when we have something like this, where every single antibiotic, unless we want to get into some of the ones we like to save for humans, like linezazoles and the vancomycin? Are we going to wait until we have this to use it? Or will we maybe start to use it when there's some sensitive antibiotics, but then again, a lot of resistant? Or maybe we should be considering something like this, where most of the, um, of the antibiotics this organism would respond to. Well, that's what I'd like to consider. I'd like to consider using microsilver as a first line of therapy, not as a last resort. And I think if we do that, we'll take the pressure off of antibiotics to constantly do the work. And we might allow some of the times the antibiotics to be sort of saved in case we absolutely have to use them. So Vet Bioderm is the vet division, is the dermatologic division of Vet uh, Biotech. And they're coming out with a whole group of products, uh, or they have come out with a whole group of products that have microsilver in it and it's the next technological step in veterinary dermatology. So here's a little bibliography that shows that there's lots of articles with the use of microsilver. This is just not um, a product that somebody uh, devised that hasn't been thoroughly tested. I thank you very much.